Kentucky family began fishing in Bayless Harbor in the mid-1800s. Martin Hickey Sr. began fishing hooks for lake trout using a 20-foot flat-bottom boat. He purchased his first boat in the late 1800s and he named it the Pathfinder. Martin Sr.'s sons, William and Martin Jr., were the next generation of fishermen in Bayless Harbor. They began fishing gill nets and pond nets in the early 1900s. And the Hickey's dock existed where the current Bayless Harbor Town Marina is today. The sons of William, Dennis and Jeffrey Hickey, are the third generation of fishermen in Bayless Harbor. They began working in the 1960s after duty in the U.S. Navy. They moved their operations to the other side of the harbor, where the Bailey Harbor's Yacht Club condos are located today. And in the 70s, they purchased a guild that boat and named it the Pathfinder in honor of their grandfather and father. And the fishing operations steadily grew throughout decades. Throughout the years, the Hickey Brothers have worked with the Wisconsin DNR, Sea Grant, Fisheries Co-op at UW Stevens Point, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife to complete numerous assessments, tagging, and research projects. And as a result, Dennis was appointed by Governor Tony Earle to the Great Lakes Fish Commission, Lake Michigan Commercial Fisheries Advisor, a position he still holds today. In 2000, Dennis Hickey's daughter Karen Stooth and son-in-law Todd Stooth became actively involved in the fishery. The brand has grown to include Bailey's Harbor Fish Company and includes a retail fish shop. The fleet of boats has grown to accommodate fishing in both the Bay of Green Bay and Lake Michigan. And the research projects that the Hickey Brothers Research LLC completed have expanded beyond Wisconsin and into the inland northwest U.S. The Hickey family welcomes you to stop by their fishery, look at the decades, decades of fishing history, see an active commercial fish processing plant, purchase local fresh fish, and hear some fish tales. Please join me in welcoming our speaker this evening, Dennis Hickey. Okay, uh, Amy has already told you some of what I have on, on my presentation here. And uh, thank you for having me. And, and this is my grandfather's house. If you go through Bailey's Harbor, uh, it would be right where the uh, town hall, the barn in the background there would be uh, right over there. That would be where the town hall sits. Right across the street would be uh, the docks. That's uh, probably taken, uh, that picture is probably taken in uh, the uh, early 20s. And if you notice along the shoreline uh, behind the net reels, uh, there's no houses, no uh, uh, building or anything. Uh, as my grandfather owned the whole north end of town, and that was his farm there. I took this uh, picture, or I should say Amy did, uh, took these uh, pictures for me and, and she put this whole uh, uh, presentation together for me with the PowerPoint uh, out of uh, uh, Schooners of Door County. And the reason I, I took it uh, was, uh, and I wanted it, is if you notice along the shoreline here, uh, all the early fish that were sent down to Milwaukee and Chicago were in barrels. I don't know, that's, I've often looked at this picture and wondered if they opened up the barrels and let the juice run in the river down there or, or what, uh, why they did that, but uh, that's, that's how the early fish were all shipped out. And uh, in the background over there, that's a, a schooner uh, like my grandfather had. He and the Brand Brothers there in Bailey's Harbor uh, uh, went together and they uh, bought a schooner, the brand's own uh, uh, general store, and uh, they hauled merchandise back from Milwaukee, and my grandfather hauled uh, fish down. This is uh, a picture of a typical ponnet. Quite often I get uh, questions about uh, how do you get the stakes in and everything, so I thought I'd spend more time on the ponnets because we were the last fishermen on uh, Lake Michigan to fish the, the big live entrapment ponnet. Uh, this is a picture of a 50-foot ponnet. Those stakes would be about uh, 60, 63 feet uh, long. And what we do is you can't find good straight uh, uh, trees uh, like that. So we splice the middle and we use maple on the bottom and ash, white ash on the top. 
and then they're spliced with, uh, uh, I take a chainsaw and cut a, a, uh, on an angle on both sides and uh, splice them together and drill through them with uh, uh, five to six big bolts. And uh, the, uh, the frame pole here is we haven't found anything and uh, since the beginning of the time that the fishermen started using ponnets, they always used uh, ironwood. And that is the toughest thing you ever want to see when you're inside uh, lifting in there. You can have a C and uh, they just bend and twist and everything. We tried using pipe and cable and everything. Nothing holds up like ironwood. So it's one of those things you, you can't beat uh, some of the old style of stuff. In, in the inside here is 36 foot square. And we actually come in from the outside here with a uh, 35 foot boat, come right inside and lay inside the net and release the corner lines. I've got some other pictures of the, of the corner lines uh, uh, that I'll show you later, but I want to keep this picture so I, I can show you uh, more stuff that uh, we have to do. Then uh, when we set it, these are the hearts. They go out heart shaped and uh, on both sides of the net. And then this would be the lead. That lead would be, uh, well, we, we have some 900 feet and some of them were 1,200 feet long. And the lead goes towards shore uh, because the principle of the whole net is that when fish come up to an obstruction, like uh, that's actually a 14 inch mesh lead, the big square lead, uh, they, they don't want to go through it. They try and go to deeper water to go around it. And that's what makes the whole net uh, fish. The ponnet is probably one of the most efficient and one of the best pieces of gear that uh, uh, the fishermen had. Uh, the fishing uh, uh, first started uh, with the uh, ponnets uh, up on, on Washington Island. And uh, they didn't fish there very long and they uh, in 1840, they were started on Washington Island. In uh, 1854, uh, they moved down toward uh, uh, North Bay and, and uh, Moonlight Bay, and they uh, uh, fished uh, ponnets down there. And that is the area that we we uh, still fish, but we fish with trap nets now. Uh, the reason we we uh, quit fishing the, the ponnets was uh, twofold. Uh, because of the zebra mussels, I think a lot of the whitefish, uh, that was the mainstay of the fishery, uh, have uh, moved to deeper water because of the water clarity. And there isn't as much feed on the inside now as there was. And the other thing is there's so many small boats and boaters now that it's just, uh, uh, you, you could mark it, I don't, unbelievable. We put lights on them and mark them everywhere, buoys everywhere. They'll still try and go right through them. So, uh, it's hopeless to try and fish them, but now the nets that we fish are called trap nets and they actually are uh, submerged underneath the water. And, uh, uh, but they're the same uh, style net, except that it has uh, a top on it where this is all open. Uh, the way that we would lift this net is you go lay the boat right inside there, release your, your corner blocks, pull the net up by hand. And one of the reasons that it was really a good net uh, to lift uh, with and everything, when you pull it by hand, it's slow and you just gradually keep working it up. And when you do, you can see the sublegal whitefish and other uh, fish squirting right out of the sides of the net. You can see them zipping out because that's bigger twine. And then it gradually you roll the fish over onto the lifter back, and that's two and a half inch twine, that's smaller. And then they'll all lay there, and I've got pictures of that too. You can see that's the frame pole that I was talking about with the ironwood uh, along there. That's the toughest thing uh, uh, you can get out there. You can have a storm and everything, those ironwood uh, frame poles hold up through you know, a, a 10, 15 foot sea. This is a picture of us when we're first setting a, a ponnet. Now there, there's a good picture too of seeing how far the lead goes towards shore there, and then how far out your hearts go. Hearts go out 150 feet. And uh, that, lead, that lead there is 1,200 feet long all the way along there. And that leads the fish out to the 36 foot square pot. On the bottom of this uh, line here is a pulley down on the bottom of the stake. And that pulls the bottom corner of the pot out and pulls it tight when we uh, get ready to leave a net. This is uh, another, uh, another picture of the releasing 
in the middle, the middle stake there uh, has the tunnel, its cone-shaped tunnel, that when the lead leads the fish all the way to the net, and then uh, they get in the hearts and circle around, and then they go into the cone-shaped tunnel. The tunnel is 12 foot wide, uh, 22 feet uh, long, and uh, uh, they varied, but we generally I uh, made them about 16 feet high. So that it's big, it's big gear, and this uh, this was fished all over, uh, uh, all the way down uh, Lake Michigan shoreline, all the way to Milwaukee, Whitefish Bay in Milwaukee. That's another picture of the stakes when we we're finishing up setting them. We use a hydraulic winch that my brother invented on the boat uh, to uh, lift the stakes up in the air. And then we actually shoved them about four feet in the mud so they didn't uh, come out of there. And then every fall, we reverse the order and pull them back out of there after we take uh, the nets and everything off of it. So I uh, looked around for, because it's the historical society, I thought I'd try and find some older pictures and stuff. This is some pictures of... Uh, the Winninger fish rig in, in Bailey's Harbor uh, with uh, wooden boats, and uh, that's a lifting boat. Uh, this was probably taken in the uh, uh, late 20s, early 30s, and uh, uh, they went right inside that net with that, that boat. Sometimes in the fall when we were lifting, we would uh, go into a net with two boats. We'd have one boat on the outside, one boat on the inside scooping. And that's all, uh, that's all live entrapment, and it's all uh, lake trout and, and whitefish, mostly whitefish in there. And uh, we pull them all up by hand. You can see he's just finishing pulling up there and, and pinning it down the rail. And then we uh, uh, get in there and, and uh, uh, scoop. We scoop uh, on, uh, uh, it's all scooped by hand. Uh, you could power scoop them, uh, but they uh, it would be too hard on the fish. What we do, we scoop into a measuring lugger like that, and then uh, we let uh, the fish uh, that uh, we don't want, we, they have to be 17 inches to be legal, but a lot of times, uh, because we're on quotas now, we can only take just so many fish. We have a one individual quota for the whole year, and we have to decide how many fish we're gonna take and when we're gonna take it. And uh, uh, because it's live entrapment, we sort through and, and we know what our orders are, and we, uh, you can see we, how many we dump back. A lot of times we're dumping back, which would be legal fish, but uh, we don't need that many fish that day or something for our orders, and, and so uh, we uh, uh, don't take them. Now, they, that's uh, lake trout. It's my son-in-law and, and one of the gillnet boats. Uh, but uh, that's a hatchery uh, fish there. I can tell it, it has a fin clip. Uh, it doesn't have a dorsal fin. But we're seeing more and more lake trout now uh, that uh, uh, are uh, naturals that have reproduction. Uh, that would be the same trout that would be in the ponette right there. That's, this is an earlier picture when we were just fishing uh, ponnets uh, uh, when we first started. We still had wooden fish boxes and uh, it was pretty cumbersome uh, to uh, shovel the fish in and, and carry all the boxes on the boats and everything with you and that. But uh, this is probably down in North Bay when we were uh, lifting. And uh, uh, sometimes when we uh, had more fish than we had boxes along, we would just uh, shovel the fish in in a bin and dump ice on top of them and uh, bring them in that way. This is, it's not always nice and calm like you saw when we were setting the stakes out there. This is what it's like a lot of days by the time you get done lifting and you're heading for home. That's, that's our Ponnet boat there. This picture was uh, taken in the uh, uh, 20s, I think. It would uh, be in Bailey's Harbor. That's uh, my dad's uh, two sisters. And they had, a, uh, I think he said it was something like a 46 pound uh, lake trout. And when they dressed it inside of it, there was a five or six pound trout. So. <laughs> Quite often uh, the earlier fisheries had a fish boil at the end of the week and all the families got together and everything. This was at Winnegar's across the harbor there. My dad fished uh, with them uh, in the later years. Uh, I would say this is uh, probably about uh, late 30s and uh, uh, this is uh, uh, 
oh, maybe uh, eight, ten families. Uh, that's about how many guys he had working there. This is, a, again, another picture of his twine boat. Uh, that's, uh, he used that for pulling the nets out and, and washing and everything. And this would be uh, a wooden boat uh, in the early uh, approaches to it. Now that's, uh, that's a picture of our, our new boats. That's the way we pull twine the same way and that's what our boats look like now. Uh, this is a, a picture taken on uh, Yellowstone Lake actually. That's uh, in the morning before we set out to uh, go gill netting on Yellowstone Lake and, and Yellowstone Park. Uh, we do do a, a lot of gill netting and uh, this would be with uh, our first boat, the wooden uh, gill net boat. Uh, uh, and uh, you set the, the gill nets out the, the stern door over a resetter bar like that. And uh, uh, the gill netting was going on uh, quite a bit uh, the time that there was uh, 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 pond net fishing. But the pond net fishing did the bulk of the volume always, all the way around the Dora Peninsula. All the way down uh, both sides of the peninsula, there were always a lot of nets. Uh, and at one time, I think it was uh, 1874, uh, there were uh, 21 ponnets set around just Chambers Island alone. And uh, the, uh, I see in the advocate files, uh, I've uh, got copies of a lot of the uh, fishing uh, information that they did at that time. They were uh, talking about uh, uh, having uh, uh, enough gill nets set uh, 18th of December, 1873, I believe it was, that uh, it would reach 50 miles, and that was just in Fish Creek alone, that uh, they were fishing that heavy during that time. And uh, uh, I think it was Kallenbach, uh, Alfred Kallenbach uh, bought seven and a half tons of lake trout about that time, about 1874, and there was really good fishing, and uh, they uh, hauled those to Sturgeon Bay uh, by uh, uh, wagon. And when it got more snow later on, uh, there were articles in the Advocate uh, files that said that they, uh, they knew it was good fishing up north and Gills Rock and so forth because there were two sleigh loads of trout came through today. This would be in January and that, you know. The fishing as far as, as the gill netting and, and uh, the uh, uh, pond netting, which of course we switched to trap nets now, but this is a, a picture of uh, the, how the fish in a gill net, when you're lifting them, it's real calm. If you get a lot of them, the nets will float right up. I, we prefer fishing the live entrapment than, than the gill nets uh, because the gill net, to get them out of the net, uh, they can still be live because we do what we call day sets now. We go out there with our sonars and find where the school is and set the nets right through it. And uh, you can start lifting as soon as you get done setting. And uh, you, don't, you don't have any bycatch, but you still the fish are not as nice as the live entrapment fish because you have to handle them to pick them through the twine and that, you know. That. This is a picture of my uncle in Bailey's Harbor uh, with, uh, again, a wooden boat uh, breaking ice uh, uh, to get out. And it's probably January. They fish chubs uh, there. This is probably in the 30s. This is our, our big uh, gill net boat. It was, was still had a Collenberg in it. And we uh, could go right on through the ice with the Collenberg. And uh, we fished a lot of chubs with this boat and that. We still have that boat, but uh, it's pulled out in the Sister Bay because uh, uh, we don't uh, have uh, any chub fishing going on right now because the, the chubs are there, but they're, they don't grow up. They're, they don't have enough feed. They're not uh, being, uh, getting mature. But uh, if chub fishing comes back, we'll, we'll have that boat back on the lake. Uh, we're rebuilding uh, one of our other gill net boats in our building there uh, at the fishery right now. This is a, a picture of a wooden gill net boat uh, that is the land that we bought right now for our dock. And that's where there was a dock and that we dug that all out of there and put in now all steel dock. And uh, that's the location. This belonged to the fishermen that uh, owned that land before us. I took uh, this picture out of a, a book because it was pretty, pretty typical all the way around Door County and, and down the line all the way to Milwaukee. 
that uh, all uh, harbors like Algoma, Sheboygan, and, on, and so on and so forth, all had a whole row of gillnet boats always parked all the way down the line. There was, fishing was a big part of the uh, industry. That's a picture again in the 30s of uh, it's uh, Rusty Meyer from Algoma, uh, Gene Heald, which was my uncle uh, from Bailey's Harbor, and my dad on the end from Bailey's Harbor. They're uh, on the roof of a uh, gillnet boat that belonged to uh, uh, Cliff Winninger in Bailey's Harbor. I think they ran that boat in the wintertime for chubs for him. That's another picture of his dock. That dock is uh, the way it looked when it, before the yacht club bought it and dug it all out and built the break wall. That goes right down the line uh, where the, the break wall is uh, there now. And that, that building right there we still have over there. That uh, was the box factory over uh, at the fishery uh, over there and they moved it across the street and it's now over there by uh, our fish house. We just keep it because I think uh, that the, this week is uh, Peninsula School of Art will be around, I think, and they'll all be painting <laughs> all over the place. And uh, we, we, uh, they enjoy it so much, we decide, well, we'll leave that there. But sometimes it's awful tempting to bulldoze and put up a new building. But we, we want to keep it there because it's part of Door County. And, and as long as it's still got a good roof and everything, we'll leave it. This is a picture of, of uh, a historical boat. Uh, it's a Marinette 42. Uh, Marinette Marine, right after, uh, well, during the war and right after the war, they built about 150 gillnet boats over in Marinette. And uh, they only built three Marinette uh, 42s. And uh, that's the only one left. Uh, there's one that's upside down and they use it for a doghouse on the Indian Reservation up by Bayfield. And uh, there's one that uh, they tried to make into a trawler and it's in Minnesota by Lake of the Woods uh, over there and uh, it's basically just scrapped out. So that's the last one left. I mean, we took that in and restored it along with this one. We call this the Kokanee because we use this one out west in uh, uh, some of our uh, uh, contracts out there uh, to restore the Kokanee salmon on Lake Pond Array. And it, it's now in Yellowstone Park. We have four Marinette 35s uh, that are left and we have four of those we bought up. The reason we did is that they'll go down, they're 13 feet wide and that's the legal limit to go down the road with a semi. And they also are the right height, you can get underneath bridges and stuff with them. Anything bigger you can't. And yet they were a good roomy little boat for uh, their size and that. So uh, I would say we probably have the best four that are still left. Uh, a lot of the other ones are all scrapped and gone now and everything. Yeah, that's another reason why we don't concentrate too much on, on gill netting uh, anymore. That's your Cladophora. If you go out in Lake Michigan and it's blowing northeast, and it doesn't matter if it's blowing much more than 10 miles an hour, that's what your gill nets are going to look like. And then you've got to sit and, and pressure wash them all and everything. That's why we're on Green Bay right now uh, fishing the live entrapment that's over there. I kept this picture because if you see, uh, we were lifting upon it. And uh, I had a hole of a lake trout that had a lamprey. You can see the lamprey hanging on it. And I wanted to talk about lampreys a little bit. And uh, so that was the only picture that I had of actually getting a, a fish with lamprey on it out in, in the lake. Uh, and uh, as Amy said before, I'm an advisor to Great Lakes Fishery Commission. And uh, one of our jobs is to try and uh, alert people to the idea that there's still lamprey and there's still a lot of work being done to control them and it costs a lot of money and so the commission is in charge of that and so uh, this last year and they, it's always been that way to, it's uh, a shared uh, uh, project between uh, Canada and the US uh, as far as the money uh, and everything for it and Canada uh, has always dragged their feet on being willing to pay their share and this last year uh, uh, they were really uh, holding out and, and uh, we couldn't get uh, the monies we needed. And so uh, fortunately, uh, 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 Congressman Gallagher and uh, 
uh, Ron Johnson uh, went to bat for us in Washington a little bit, and we got enough money now for uh, lamprey control again, but it's an ongoing battle all the time. And if you have never seen a lamprey, we had the commission uh, uh, built these uh, uh, models of a lamprey, and they're, they're pretty accurate. They're even like a little bit slippery. I'll pass them out here if you want to pass them around and you can get a close look uh, at what a lamprey would look like. The first lamprey uh, uh, weir that we had uh, built was uh, in, uh, uh, yeah, it was in Hibbert's Creek in 1947. This is before the Great Lakes Fishery Commission even uh, 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 was uh, ratified. The uh, Fishery Commission uh, that deals with all the lamprey was, uh, uh, they uh, argued back and forth all the way uh, from uh, the beginning of World War II to the uh, 1954, 55 when they ratified it, to uh, 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 over funding and how they should go about. But every year from, uh, say, 1940 on, the uh, uh, lake trouts became less and less uh, out there. And uh, finally, in uh, 54, they uh, uh, ratified the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, and then they agreed to share the monies. But Hibbert's Creek was the first uh, uh, lamprey weir, and it was a combination electro and uh, mechanical barrier. And the U.S. did that on their own. They were already working on trying to uh, 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 eradicate the lamprey and uh, they also were also working on uh, lamprey control with lampricide and uh, they were experimenting with some of that but it got to be about uh, into the f uh, 50s uh, before they actually came up with a lampricide that really worked good and they tried several other things like sterile mail and and uh, several things the uh, catch of lake trout uh, was down to 3,000 pounds uh, in uh, 1952. 1943, it was 7 million pounds of uh, lake trout right here in Door County. So uh, that's uh, uh, how bad the lamprey had got. Once the lamprey took over uh, and uh, uh, pretty well wiped out all the lake trout, uh, the, uh, uh, it was kind of interesting because they did save the uh, stock of uh, uh, lake trout uh, uh, and they took it to Lewis Lake in Wyoming. And uh, the uh, Fish and Wildlife still uses Lewis Lake to get their brood stock for planting uh, lake trout. They, and then in the early 50s, they started uh, planting lake trout back. There were a lot of people that were naysayers that said, oh, you'll never get uh, uh, the lake trout back. And, and, uh, uh, but they, they kept on and, and uh, through a, a lot of effort over the years and everything, uh, I can say that uh, we, uh, we've we actually got pretty good reproduction of natural lake trout right now. We have to, we're not allowed to take any lake trout and we buy lake trout uh, from the tribal guys on northern end of Lake Michigan and uh, they fish basically the, probably the same fish that they're dumping in on the southwest corner of Beaver Island out there that are planted by fish and wildlife. And then uh, we have to buy them and bring them back and we can smoke them and, and sell them to our people and that. But uh, uh, we, we see a, a lot of natural reproduction. The, uh, I've been uh, keeping track of it and I take pictures of it and everything of the lake trout that we buy. Uh, they have about 70 to 75% natural reproduction uh, that they're getting out of the north end of Lake Michigan. Last winter when we were gill netting out there, we were getting uh, 30, and I saw it as high as 50, but it was mostly, I'd say it averaged about 30% natural reproduction. But looking at what I've seen that the sport fishery has brought in, because we process a lot of fish for the sport fishery in uh, 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 all the way, uh, the, the farthest I've seen a guy come was just the other day, all the way from Kiwani, he came with three lake trout. And he had uh, two of them were natural uh, lake trout that he caught. He saw a big school of fish, and so he trolled through it and he caught uh, two trout, two lake trout. And then uh, uh, he was still trolling later that day again for salmon because it was the salmon tournament this last week. And uh, uh, he he caught a hatchery uh, lake trout. 
when he brought them up there. And I've, I've got pictures of those two uh, natural, and they are the same year class. To me, it looks like the same ones that we're buying from Northern Lake Michigan up there. That uh, So there has to be one big hatch of uh, natural lake trout out there. And that's the same size that uh, in the 30% that we were getting last winter uh, in the gillnets out front. I'd see that same size. There's a big crop of them in that. So. Uh, they have a, a, the dorsal fin uh, is uh, clipped on them. That's, uh, I know I was talking to people before, that's one of the uh, new aluminum boats that uh, we uh, had built. That's the Palmer Johnson crew that built the boats for us. And we put the engines and the hydraulics and all the wiring and everything in ourselves. And that, that boat's out west. That's a trap net boat now. That's the boat we had to switch to but it's set up for lifting gill nets right there. You can see the roller in that, but it'll lift gill nets or trap nets. But uh, uh, we switched to that because uh, we, uh, it'd be pretty hard to fish uh, pond nets anymore, even though we still have all of our nets and everything, but I, well, you never know, things could change, but uh, uh, we're, we're probably better off to stick with the trap nets. We have another situation that uh, we're concerned about is over on the Green Bay side, right after the walleyes are spawning, uh, they come out into the nets and they just uh, gorge themselves on small whitefish. Yeah, a lot of times when uh, the fish are coming to the surface in the net, they're burping up small whitefish. This is whitefish that they had in them. And we're concerned that uh, uh, the walleye population is uh, really getting big on, on Green Bay side. And uh, they're one of the fierce predator fish. And like here in Wisconsin, they're real happy about that because it's a great sport fishery and it's uh, brought a lot of money in and economic impact. But now in, in Idaho, where we're working, uh, they have us uh, get those out of there because they were concerned that they're eating up their native species. And uh, they've got all their, their native trout, really beautiful fish and that, that the walleyes are gonna eat up. This is a, a, about a, a, oh, I'd say a 10 or 12 inch whitefish in the mouth of a, a walleye. You couldn't get it all the way down, but. So they're a fierce predator. One of the things that people ask about too is whether we still save the caviar out of the uh, uh, fish. And in the fall when we're dressing the fish in the whitefish, we say whitefish and herring both. Uh, the herring we get from Lake Superior, we buy those. But we don't have any on, uh, we have an occasional one on Lake Michigan. Uh, but uh, uh, it's mainly the whitefish uh, caviar that we do in the fall. Uh, uh, the, after you pick the eggs, you uh, rub them on a screen like that. And then they go into the kettles. And then they're washed. You have to wash them off. And then uh, they're poured out onto other screens. And uh, then they're, they're dried. They're dried and then they're salted. They're mixed and, and salted. And then uh, uh, we export uh, more, uh, most of it uh, to the Scandinavian countries, both Sweden and uh, uh, Norway. And uh, uh, we do have more and more people now that are uh, uh, buying it here that are interested in Door County caviar. And that's, that's what it looks like. Uh, the people that know what it is, they, they come right in and want it. And other people, they're a little skeptical yet about caviar. This again is one of our trap net boats lifting uh, a trap net. The trap net actually comes up and goes all the way across the boat. And uh, because it has a top on it, it slides the fish all to one side, just like the ponnet lift, they'd all be in there live entrapment uh, lift. This was taken in Yellowstone Park, but it's uh, a good picture to show you the shape of a trap net. I uh, stood on the roof of one of the trap net boats. You can see the pot down in uh, the bottom, down here. This is the pot portion. And then this is your hearts. You got a double heart there. That's, and then your fish come up the lead right down the middle here. And they go in here and they circle around and they keep on circling, work their way up and through the tunnel into the net. And, uh, that's how the net sits in the water. It's, it's, it looks pretty small here, but that's, uh, that's still uh, uh, about 150 feet from here to there and, and back. And that's uh, 22 feet across here. That's when you're getting ready to, uh, to lift the trap net, that's the lifting lines 
they come in and we pull the, the boat right underneath the whole net. This is uh, this year. This is, uh, I think, uh, about a Thursday before the 4th of July. Uh, we're in uh, uh, Carmody Park over in uh, uh, Little Sturgeon, and that's one of our trap net boats coming in with the uh, 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 trap net uh, whitefish. And uh, w that day we decided that we we're going to try and catch up because it's before the 4th of July. We had a lot of orders for uh, uh, restaurants and that. And that's the advantage to fishing live entrapment. Uh, you can do that. Uh, and then we back up uh, like that and they slide uh, the fish into the uh, reefer trucks over there. Those are our trucks. And then I tried to go right down the line what happens with the fish, the way we process them, the way we handle them compared to the wooden barrels on the dock and that. And then when they get to the fishery, the boys slide them right in uh, there and they're taken to the scaling machine. And then uh, the guys cut the heads off and then they go over to the other guy standing there and they go into the uh, filleting machine. They come out of the filleting machine and they get dipped in ice water and they're uh, stacked uh, in uh, plastic totes and they're put in the cooler until they have time to start packing them. And they're, they're packed in, in uh, white boxes, weighed and packed, and they go off to the restaurant. Generally we try and get in by 11 in the morning uh, if we can. And uh, this is about 3 in the afternoon and they'll still take those to the restaurants. That's, uh, that's a sport caught lake trout. See the, uh, the, the fin there? That's a natural. We, we've been buying lake trout uh, from the tribal. We're not allowed to take them, but we have so much uh, uh, demand for uh, lake trout now because they're really, the Lake Michigan lake trout that are natural, they're really a, a nice product that uh, we buy them from the tribal guys on the northern end of Lake Michigan. They can take them and then uh, uh, we uh, sell them. Now, if you look, you'll see that's a natural. That one might be a hatchery. That's a natural. That's a natural. That's natural. That's natural. Uh, I can't see from here. That might be a hatchery. That's, I can't see from here. That's a hatchery. That's a natural. That's hatchery. That's natural, natural. And that, anyhow, we, we figure it out. We keep track of them and, and watch that. They're running about 70 to 75% naturals. Uh, that uh, we've got out there. And that's the same size, even like you saw those sport caught uh, fish there, they're about that same year class. And uh, uh, there, see here I've, I've got another picture of one that, that's bigger, so that's a different year class and, and he's a natural too. You know, uh, that came in with the Indian fish in that. That's that 26 pound uh, lake trout that was caught in front of Bailey's Harbor this year. And uh, uh, if you look right there, it's a natural. That's the other uh, reason why we ask when uh, we buy salmon from the, uh, buyer, uh, the fish houses up north is uh, that we can get uh, the Lake Michigan. Uh, this actually is, is not as bright as it normally is. And, it, and they took the picture on top of a bloody uh, uh, table, but that's, they're almost as orange on the uh, uh, lake trout uh, that are out there now, the naturals, as sockeye salmon from Alaska. And this, everybody asks always, what do you do with the scraps? So I had to take a picture of that for you. And uh, fortunately, Amy could do that. She had took pictures off my phone she, of a pile of pictures of, from all over and put it all together for us. So. That's our fish market over there. That's the front. That's the, the big building in back there is where they work on boats. That's where my boat is in there now. Bay Ship guys are working on it. So as a retail shop. Uh, we smoke a lot of fish. Uh, we have a computerized smoker. Well, it's sideways, but that's our, that's our uh, dock. Uh, down there, that's the main slip in there, and uh, the, these are the other two islands out there. I can take some questions if, okay. <laughs> Fresh, 
Oh, oh yes, we deliberately get uh, uh, the uh, uh, lake trout in, uh, and we have them uh, up there, the buyer up there, because he gets whitefish from us too, and he, he uh, because we'll send him whitefish, he'll cooperate with the lake trout with us, and uh, uh, he, he saves out uh, the smaller ones, and we have fresh uh, lake trout fillets too. Are you open for tours at all? Well, anytime you come in there, if you come after lunch, uh, you can, you're welcome. There's always somebody standing there watching, you know, the, the process where they're dumping the fish and, you know, uh, filleting and, and going through it and that. And if, if I'm around there and, and uh, uh, you see me, I'll, I'll take you back and show you where they're working on boats. And also half of that building is where they string nets all winter long too and, and that in there. So there's always something going on somewhere around there. Yeah, they call them uh, steak nets uh, over by, uh, uh, actually our grandfather came from the Rennessee Islands in Norway and uh, my wife and I were over there about six, eight years ago and uh, the original farmhouse that uh, he came from and it was still there, it's a farm and they still fish pretty much what we'd call old fashioned and they, uh, they still fish steak nets over there yeah. for herring mostly there. Is there a certain age when lake trout are really eat? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, how, what's the oldest one you ever saw, Mark? How long did I get in that? Uh, actually, two questions. Okay. Yeah. One is, uh, why are the whitefish uh, biting on the hook and line now? And second of all, why do the lamprey concentrate on the lake trout? Well, I think the lake trout have smaller scales. And uh, uh, hook and line, uh, I think that the, the baits and the jigs and the equipment that they have, the sport fishery have, it's no longer just hope that you catch a fish. You can go out there. Uh, I went on the ice with my grandsons and they were fishing perch. And they didn't, they see enough whitefish. They weren't interested in fishing whitefish this winter. And all of a sudden uh, they have a TV in the corner of their shanty that's hitched to their uh, uh, camera that's down on the bottom. And uh, they were watching the perch and they're keeping an eye on them. All of a sudden the whitefish swam through. And I said, oh, geez, there's a dandy whitefish, about two and a half pound whitefish. And he says, whoa, you want to see me catch it? And it swam out of the picture. And so he dropped a, 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 a lead sinker down and he tapped it on the bottom and the mud splashed up a little bit. All of a sudden, here, here comes the whitefish back. And he lowers down a minnow and uh, uh, the whitefish was coming real slow and looked at it. And he, he went over and he twisted on his line so he could get it. I don't know if it was the head or the tail. He had to get it the right direction and the whitefish grabbed it. He had the whitefish. But they never used to catch them on hooking lines. Well, I think they've got better baits and better technology now. They, they get out there and, and uh, it's no longer, because if one guy gets into a good school of whitefish, he gets on his cell phone, calls the other guy, and here he comes with his snowmobile and track machine and pop up shanty and there they go there it, it's no longer uh, you know that it's an innocent th type thing they can really do a number the sport fishery there's no question about it catches more whitefish on green bay than our quota than the commercial quota they, if they have good ice last winter they didn't and that that helped uh, the whitefish stocks we noticed that right away this spring that the stocks were in real real good shape you know but uh uh, when they, they can get at it, and the way it's advertised and promoted in magazine, sport magazines and, and fishery magazines and that, that uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it's, I think the bag limit, uh, uh, I don't think, how many is the bag limit? Uh, 10? Yeah. 10 in the morning, 10 in the afternoon. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, 
yeah. We, I love ice fishing in the winter, but uh, the last three years we haven't had good enough ice. I don't want to go out there. I don't want to take a chance, you know, uh, with our equipment and everything. Uh, I don't want to drop the nets and, and uh, everything. Uh, it's, it's, what are you using for fishing? Well, <clears throat> we can, uh, we either go ice fishing, you know, drill a hole, and, and we have a hydraulic drill, and uh, uh, we can run uh, the lines on, uh, underneath the ice, uh, and then uh, pull our nets in with a running line, and uh, uh, then you pull the nets in by hand. We could use a, a hydraulic lifter too if we wanted to, but we do it by hand, uh, you know, the way it is. But, and and it would, if you had a good winter and good, good solid ice, we could keep up with the restaurant orders and, and everything just fishing on the ice. But what we do is that's why we're rebuilding that boat that we have in the, in the big building there now because we're putting the all new steel on it, all new bottom, halfway up the sides, you know, all the, all the decking, everything will be new, new engine, everything. Because now with there aren't any other fishermen out there, you're all alone 10 miles out on Lake Michigan, you know, in January. You better have some good equipment, you know, on that. But uh, to be able to rebuild that burger boat and make it like new, uh, that's a good investment anyhow. Yeah. How should commercial fishery, fishery then are they selected for You actually only have about three real fish rigs left in Door County. And the interesting thing is, uh, in uh, that information that I got out of the Door County Advocate, uh, in 1874, uh, I think uh, there were uh, two ponets set by two different Weebergs. And they are also one of the guys that switched the trap nets like we did. And, and uh, actually, they switched the trap nets before we did. We fished ponets longer than anybody. And uh, uh, they're still fishing trap nets in probably the same spots that they fished the uh, uh, ponets in, uh, say, the 1860s, 70s, you know, and that. And that's the thing, uh, we have all of our lines for our ponnets are still out of the lake, our anchor lines for the stakes. They're pulled into a harness and pulled real tight and uh, they're laying on the bottom out there. I'm sure they're coated in zebra mussel. But if we wanted to, we could go right back to that exact spot and set uh, those uh, nets back. Uh, we had a, uh, a net in Moonlight Bay that uh, we set in a spot that I know our grandfather fished and uh, uh, it fished really good. And when we were doing the uh, work with uh, University of Wisconsin Stevens Point Fisheries Co-op, we tagged fish after the season and they were doing an age growth and migration study on whitefish. And we had two jumbo whitefish that came back two years in a row on the same day. Uh, to that <laughs> uh, Oh yeah, yeah. We had we had one uh, out in, in uh, well, it would be northeast of Bailey's Harbor a little bit, uh, about in the middle of Moonlight Bay, and it was out in 42 fathom, and uh, 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 we thought it was a schooner, and uh, uh, it turned out uh, we got stuck on it several times, and then uh, I had the dive club from Green Bay came up and they were asking us about it. And uh, in the Door County Advocate files, uh, it said that it's in uh, this same boat, we know it is now, uh, in, uh, they said it was in 43 or 44 fathom, and we knew it was in 42 fathom because uh, we would go to the inside end of our chub gang and uh, uh, set out, and we'd, uh, every once in a while I'd see it on the radar and just go right up, right across the top of it, down again. And uh, it turned out that it was a steam tug Levington, and they found it. Uh, it uh, had a 12-inch shaft and wheel, and it was pushing two barges. I think that was, I, I can't remember the date for sure, but it was, uh, uh, surprisingly, it was in the 1900s. It was maybe about 1910 or so, and uh, they twisted the wheel off, and it twisted the shaft off up in the stern tube, and it just, 12 inch shaft, it just sank, just shoom, just like that. And uh, I guess now they, there's actually a, a book somewhere, and I haven't seen the pictures, but people have told me, I think some of the divers did since, 
they found it. Uh, we told them where it was by using our numbers for the end of our Chub Gang, and they uh, went back and, and found it out there. And that, but now with the water clarity, they use the side scanning sonar and that. They find that would really be neat to recover something. They say it's sitting there just perfect, and that's the way it went down too, uh, with the shaft just sunk like that. You know. Well, the, the one, I don't, did, I don't know if I had that picture on here or not, the gillnet boat with the two or three women standing on the bow named Pathfinder. That was a burger a boat built by uh, Burger Boat Works, and it was number 19. I've still got the documents for it. So that was a, a it's a strip lath boat, and I would say it was probably old. Oh, you, oh, what we do or, or <clears throat> well we've got the big building there right now I've got my boat right in the middle of it but it's all heated in the winter and that the, the guys say that they'll have it out of there yet this fall I hope they do because we want to use it this winter and uh, uh, then in the winter uh, it doesn't matter if it's snowing or whatever uh, we have another big door that opens up to the storage room and, and all the nets the big trap nets are put on pallets we go in there with a forklift, pick up the pallet you want, bring it out, set it down on the floor, and they spread it out, check it all for mending. It's all mended, labeled which net it is, where it's going to go for the next year, and you put it back on the racks and the shelves in that big back building. I got, I'd be happy to give you, if I'm around there, I'd give you a tour and, and show you. It's, it's come a long ways from some of the earlier fishing, and that's why there's probably only three fish rigs left but I think the three fish rigs that are left are all live entrapment fish rigs, and we probably are producing close to what, uh, say, 150 fishermen were producing before. Because a lot of the guys, even on the Ponnet uh, rigs, they were like uh, two or three different families all got together, and, and uh, one owned the net, one owned the boat, one made steaks. And then they used the real goal of it was to uh, produce fish for living and for their family, you know, and, and for their neighbors and everything. And then they shipped some. So it was a different type of fishery, you know. So, but the uh, DNR sets the overall quota. They set the overall allowable harvest. And then we own a percentage of that harvest and uh, uh, of that quota, I should say. And uh, uh, that's why we, we fish for the market or for what we need for our restaurant orders or whatever. We could easily go out there uh, with the stocks of fish, and uh, we could easily fish ourselves out of business in a couple months. But you don't want to do that because uh, you can get more money out of your fish. That's one of the reasons why we still do caviar at that, because uh, we export that to Norway and Sweden, and, and uh, there's, there's a big demand for that over there, golden caviar. How big do they get? Oh, uh, well, out of Green Bay. Just I'll give you a current. Uh, the other day, I I saw my uh, grandson with. Uh, I think it was, he said it was a 12 pounder, but uh, uh, I've seen him up to 18 pounds. Down in Whitefish Bay, uh, say uh, uh, that's probably 30 years ago. But that's not to say that there wouldn't be some out there that big right now too. Tell us how many pounds a white fish you're allowed to take there. Uh, I think our, our quota on the bay is uh, 140,000, I think. Uh, they, they cut our quota on the lake, so I'm not sure just what that's at right now. It used to be about uh, 200,000 or, or so, but I think they cut it way back because the stocks uh, have declined here in the last few years. But uh, I, I'm not sure what the, the quota is. But that we wound up having to buy, to get our quota on the bay, we bought out probably uh, 20, 25 other fishermen, small fishermen to get small quotas, to keep adding it into ours to get to the quota that we have. So that's, that was the goal of the DNR when they went to limited entry fishery, was to 
uh, not have so many fishermen, but uh, that uh, the fishermen that were out there were serious and had a, a good investment and, and uh, uh, that they would, uh, you know, be able to uh, manage the fishery better that way. Right now, I don't, a lot of people don't realize, too, that the, uh, the amount of reporting that we do, uh, we actually do, I think, a, a lot of the assessment work for the DNR, and they can sit in their office, and it comes right in on their computer twice a day for them, you know, from all, uh, all three fish rigs. Uh, what we have to do is, is they wanted us to do it now. As soon as we come out of the, the net, we have to count all the fish. doesn't matter if it's white fish or if it's sublegal that we're throwing overboard or if it's legal that we throw. Everything has to be accounted for. And every sucker, lawyers, uh, uh, burbot, uh, you name it, it all has to be accounted for. And they wanted us to come out of the net, lay there, and send it to them. Punch it all in and send it to them. You got to uh, send them the lat and longitude of each net, the inside and outside end of the net, like the end of the lead and uh, outside, so they know exactly which net you're in, so they can sit and figure that out. And it all go, gets called in. But we, we just don't have time, and we said it's ridiculous, because it blows 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning, it starts blowing every day. It always seems like that, anyhow. And, you know, we can't waste the time. We've got to get going and get those fish back for processing and that. So we said, we'll give you the estimated catch. The estimated catch has to go in before you get to the dock. Uh, and a lot of times, I'm sure the wardens are getting it on their computer, and so they're sitting off watching how many boxes we unload, you know, to see if it matches what, what we already called in. And then what the guys do, they put it on a card after every net, and they put all the cards together, and then they hand them to my daughter. And then uh, at the, she collects them all. At the end of the day, then she sits and fills out all that paperwork for each net. It has to have, you know, what it had in it, and it has to be uh, uh, sent in. And then in the lake... Uh, because we fish different grid zones, we fish actually from Whitefish Bay as a grid zone, then uh, uh, up, up to North Bay, or to a, a Bailey's Harbor is a different grid zone, and then North Bay. So if we lift all the way along the line, it has to be three individual separate reports on all of the individual nets have to go in every day. And then it has to be in by midnight of the same day that you lift, or otherwise you could get a fine or you could lose your license. So that's the kind of uh, regulations that we uh, we're working with, you know. So. Well, this time of the year we're, we're really lucky. We got a bunch of high school kids, and they really go at it. Uh, so uh, we've probably got uh, six or eight high school kids, and about uh, eight or ten. Uh, uh, full-time guys in Bailey's Harbor. But I know like Yellowstone Park carries a staff of about 24 guys. And girls too, we have uh, women too. And then we have uh, guys in Idaho too, we have another uh, plant there. So uh, I, my daughter, that's why she didn't have time yeah. <laughs> to do the PowerPoint uh, for us, you know, on that, so. Well, thank you so much. Well, I know I learned a lot of new things and won't ever eat fish the same again. <laughs> I will be thinking about you and all of your boats and everything the next time I enjoy a meal out. So thank you so much uh, for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank all of you for coming. Have a